Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. He is the mayor of the Township of Gore in the province of Quebec. Please help me welcome his worship, Mayor Scott Pierce. May your worship, Mayor Scott, how are you? Scott's just fine. I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on, because uh, as we try to talk about municipalities, we always forget Quebec because we always think that only Quebecers speak French. But no, they don't. They also speak French and English. So thank you so much for doing this and coming on the show. So before we get started, I'm going to ask you the question I've asked every political person on this show, uh, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Scott? Oh boy, I grew up in a town, uh, Greenfield Park, just outside Montreal, and that, that a very tight knit community where people got involved in everything. Uh, I grew up playing football, and the football was God in Greenfield Park. Uh, every kid, you had to play football, otherwise you'd be disowned. So watching what, coaches, what position? What position? I've got to ask because I'm a linebacker. So let's let's hear what position. <laughs> I was free safety. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh, but that had whole atmosphere of volunteerism and then the people uh, working together to get things done. And it's not a rich community, but rich when it came to uh, partnerships and, and working together. Uh, so I learned there early on the importance of community. And um, I got involved in a couple of elections there, uh, helping out some people that I knew that were running. And then when I moved to the my, my community now that I've been here for 25 years, um, there wasn't much going on. Beautiful community, nice people, but there they, we didn't even have a park for the kids. So uh, I started with a few buddies and uh, doing events and getting you know stuff for kids. And uh, eventually, people asked me to run for council, so I, I did so. And after I was a councillor for one year, uh, uh, the mayor at the time they had a piece of land, so I ended up there with some friends and coolers and chainsaws and started to clear for a park and. Uh, so cool to see people would just stop and what are you doing? We'd say, we're getting ready to build a park. And the next day there was more people coming to help us and more coolers of beer. And uh, uh, down the road, we actually got a nice park built for the kids in the community. And uh, a year later I was elected mayor. Um, and I've been mayor now for 18 years. Since 2005, if I'm not mistaken, correct? 2004, if I remember. But, okay. Uh, so I want to I want to go back to giving back to the community because you talked about your your upbringing in your community and how it was a, sort of instilled upon you to give back. You can give back in many different ways. You can give back through nonprofits, volunteerism, but you chose the political route. And I want to know, was politics discussed at the dinner table? Because I always find it fascinating trying to find the moment <laughs> people realize that politics was in their blood. For you, do you remember that first campaign, that first conversation, that first uh, candidate that you went, you know what, I can see myself emulating this person? Well, growing up, I absolutely hated politics. Uh, I'm a I'm a Quebecer, as you know, an English Quebecer, and I grew up during the heat of the referendums and uh, the the problems we were having here in Quebec. And my parents were fearful that they would have to move el elsewhere, and they didn't feel welcome in Quebec at that point. So I grew up really disliking politicians of all levels. I I still get mildly offended when people call me a politician. <laughs> it was just odd. <laughs> but, Oops. Um, yeah. <laughs> It was just something it was I, I found it sad growing up watching my parents fearful that they, they'd have to move because they, they weren't liked anymore. Um, so it was more, um, I guess, at a certain point, I was listening to talk radio and there was a fellow out of Ottawa named Lowell Green and Lowell Green's more, I'd say, middle conservative. Um, but he pointed out a lot of times uh, for the city of Ottawa, good decisions, bad decisions and. I started to take more of an interest into uh, public policy, I would say. Um, it, not necessarily the political gamesmanship that we see today, but more public policy. What can we do as a community to do community building, to get people on board, to make sure that everyone wants to work together and build a nice place to live in? And that's how I started, really. I had no real goals. Uh, just people asked me to run because of the things I was doing for the kids and for the community. And I thought, well... I'll put my money where my mouth is and uh, I'll put my name in the hat. And uh, was it an I've easy been... yes? Was it an easy yes to say, yes, I'll put my name in the hat because you talk about I'll put my money where my mouth is. But 
municipal politics is a unique beast in itself because you are the front line of politics. You go to the grocery store, you hear from your constituents, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, For someone who hadn't had experience going into that first election as a councillor, was it an easy, okay, sure, why not, let's do this? Or was there some mm, and ahs uh, along the way before you actually went into that city hall and actually filed your paperwork? No, I think what it was was the groundswell of support that I felt from the community that made it an easy yes. Um, And every election comes around, I kind of judge, are people still happy with the work I'm doing? Are they still happy with me? And uh, that's how I've decided to keep running because it's the support I get. And it's nice, like last election, we had our elections in November uh, last year. And I guess about two months before the election, I was just inundated with emails and texts and people saying, uh, we hope you're running again. So that kind of made it again easy for me to to say, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it uh, at least one more time. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I um, every person in my community has my cell phone number. Um, so I get to hear everything and I mean everything (laughs) and it's not a huge community. I think we have about 2,500 full-time residents and we have cottagers as well because we have 26 lakes. So I guess overall there's about 5,000 people in the community and they all have my cell phone and in the regional level, I'm the, what they call the warden, uh, the spokesperson for the nine mayors of the region. So a lot of the people in the other communities have my cell phone and being the, 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 the English guy in Quebec, uh, a lot of the English folks from different communities call me uh, when they have issues or want to discuss something. So I find that's a good thing, though, because rumors don't start. Uh, people can't lie and create stories that, because people can just call me and ask me, well, why did you do this or why is this raising? And and I find uh, it makes the job simpler uh, where people can actually contact you directly and ask the questions they, they want to know. And uh, I enjoy that part of it. I mean, it's funny. There's days where it's just, you know, I remember it was a, uh, a Sunday morning, I was in bed with my wife and my phone rang and it was a lady I know, a nice lady. And she says, Scott, I have a problem. I said, what's that? She says, well, my neighbor is burning the leaves outside. I said, okay, is there a permit posted? She says, oh yeah. I said, so what's the problem? She goes, well, the wind changed direction. Now the smoke's coming in my kitchen window. So I just said, close your freaking window. <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? I can't control the wind. Anyway, she started to laugh and she says, you're right. I'm sorry to bother you. I said, it's okay. It's uh, <laughs> You know, it's life. I can see it's annoying to have smoke in your window, but just close your window till she's done. And, uh, you know, it's part of being a neighbor. You know, uh, we do our best to get along with each other, but there's times where maybe there's irritants and the mayor can't do much about uh, smoke and uh, wind. So this, I, I love I love guests like yourself who are very animated, but also very uh, poor with co- uh, details because I wasn't going <laughs> to ask this question until later on, but I'll ask it now. How do you balance that, though? Because giving your cell phone away to everyone means that you are telling them you have an issue. You can call me. How do you balance that? Because you're a person, too. You need your downtime. You need your family time. You need your time for vacation. You also need your time where you have another job, I'm assuming, as well. Because unless in uh, Quebec, um, small town mayors make a lot of money, which I'm assuming they don't. You no. you are working also as someone else. So how do you balance that? Because your constituents, no matter what, they think their issue is the most important issue. So how do you balance that need of, okay, this is Scott's time and this is Mayor Pierce's time? It's it's really tough, to be honest with you. It's the toughest part of the job. I, uh, I'm mayor 24 hours a day. And when there's a problem, it bothers me. I lose sleep at night. I'm forever trying to find solutions. It, it happened one time where my wife and I, we love to fish and we were fishing on Lake Ontario and I, a phone rang and I answered it and I probably shouldn't have because it's a gentleman who likes to speak for hours at a time. And uh, eventually my wife just looked at me and said, bring me back to the dock because I'm not going to sit in the boat in the middle of the lake listening to this all day. And that kind of hit me there. So I let the gentleman off and I, I said, look, I got to go. So now what we try to do when my wife and I are having our time is... Uh, you know, I'll take a period of four to five hours without answering the phone. And I'm learning more and more to try. And because, you know, you always think it's an emergency when someone calls to. That's the problem. I mean, I'm always worried that there's an emergency. And if I'm not there to answer the phone, you know, maybe the problem gets worse. Maybe someone, uh, you know, especially when we've seen some of the weather issues, the floodings and the forest fires and things that we deal with uh, as municipalities. Well, I, I get concerned if uh, if I don't answer the phone, but I'm learning more and more with my wife's help just to maybe 
take a few hours off in a day, uh, especially when we're together, if we're out for dinner or, you know, just having our quality time. I think that's the most important part is uh, having, well, I'm, I'm blessed to have the wife I have. So she's patient and she understands it because she's in politics as well. My wife's a member of our provincial government here in Quebec. Uh, so uh, we're, uh, <laughs> we're often adversaries on, on discussions. <laughs> Not adversary in life, but uh, uh, her provincial government at times gets under my skin and uh, I think I get under their skin as well. <laughs> um, you, you chose municipal politics. Uh, people came to you to talk about municipal politics. You could have chosen many different routes. You could have chosen the route that your wife took, provincial. You could have chosen federal, but you chose municipal. What was the uh, uh, the, the 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 allure of uh, municipal politics? Because I've ran for municipal politics in my past, and I can tell you, you think that you're going to change the world once you put your name on that ballot. But then once I hear people who have gotten elected, you go, oh, so you think you're going to change the world, but then you realize that government moves at a slower pace municipally. So for you, what was the allure of municipal politics? Outside of the fact that people asked you, you had to say yes. So what was it about municipal politics that drew you to it? I think having that opportunity, I consider it an honor to, to work with people in the community. I think that's one of the things that it's funny. It's um, when my wife first ran for provincial government here, originally I was supposed to be the candidate and uh, I had had discussions with the government or with the party at the time. And uh, at the end, I just couldn't do it. I love what I was doing municipally. I love working on the board of the FQM. I'm the representative of the bilingual municipalities of Quebec and at the FCM uh, now I'm first vice president. I love what I was doing. And I, I finally had to tell the party, look, I, I can't do it. I got to stay in municipal. And uh, I said, I'm not even the best candidate in my house. And uh, so the, the party said, well, who's your wife? And I, I just mentioned my wife's name and they, they said, wow, can we talk to her? I said, sure. So I said, honey, phone. And she looked at me kind of strange, like, what? I said, just answer the phone. Anyway, they, they had their, their talk and uh, they offered her the opportunity to be a candidate here. And um, it was our kids that convinced her because my wife's a biologist. Um, she spent 25 years uh, working on environmental issues, helping municipalities across Quebec. And uh, so it was our kids that said, mom, you've been complaining for years that uh, the governments all make bad decisions on environment. Now you have a chance to be at the table. Uh, you can't pass that up. So she eventually ran and, uh, and won and she just got reelected again now. But uh, really, it came down to. I think, you know, it, someone said it to me the other day, uh, Scott, after 18 years, uh, have you ever thought of running for a superior level of government? And I just looked at them kind of funny. I said, there is no superior level of government than municipal. We're the ones on the front lines. We're the experts locally. We know people's dreams, people's worries in our community. And we have the honor and the pleasure of, of working with them day to day. I don't think as a federal or provincial member, you have that. And, and to me, that's the most important part. At, at the end of the day, I think we have a bigger impact on people's lives on the municipal level than they do at the federal and provincial level. And that's one thing that I've brought up in the past and I'm going to keep fighting for. When you see the, the voting rates in elections federally and more people vote than provincial and, and provincially more people vote than municipal. I think that's a grave error because the municipal people have the biggest impact on your day-to-day -day lives. We do the most with you and for you. And when you look at the way money is spent in Canada, out of every dollar collected in taxes, I mean, 45 cents goes to the feds, 45 cents goes to the provincial and everything you get in your municipality is done with 10 cents on the dollar. Imagine if we had 20 cents on the dollar how we can lower your your municipal tax rates and give better services. So to me, I think what we're doing at the municipal, I'm so proud to be a, a municipal person and I'm proud of the people I get to work with across the country. As I said in our pre-interview, I try not to do a lot of research on people because I want to learn <laughs> from you. But uh, there was an article that you gave, you, there was an interview you gave with CBC where you talked about this issue, talked about um, people not getting involved municipally. And I think uh, <laughs> Quebec is not an outlier here. Uh, we saw in BC recently with a lot of people getting acclaimed. In your time in office, have you been acclaimed to office in uh, certain elections or have you always had a challenger? And I'm not trying to say uh, challengers are bad because challenges are good for democracy, I think. But for you, have you always had that ability to run against someone so that way you can always put the best ideas forward? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, generally speaking, I've always had at least one, sometimes two candidates run against me. I'll tell you what, though. <clears throat> 
I was, I'm blessed. Um, every election, my entire council was elected with me. I never lost a member of my team. But there was a gentleman years ago who moved into our community. And I got to know him over the years. And he was a vice president of Bell Canada, very wealthy gentleman, highly intelligent business expert. And I asked him to run, you know, to be on council. And he says, okay, I'll do it, but only for one mandate. And, uh, and I said, good, we need your help. We want to kind of revamp how we do budgets and, and your expertise will come in handy. Well, this gentleman never collected. It wasn't a big salary as a counselor in a small town. I think it was like four or $500 a month, but never, never took that money. He always gave it to our local daycare to buy books for the kids. Uh, we got a grant to, um, to renovate our community center. And uh, he shows up one day in his holy jeans and his dirty baseball cap. And he pulls out a check that looks like it's gone through the wash about 20 times. He says, here. This will help with the community center. It was a check for $25,000 personally from him. Um, he did everything for the four years. And, and I, I'll never forget, after the election when he won, he said, Scott, if I would have known people were this nasty, I wouldn't have done this. But now that it's over and I'm here, I'll give you my best for four years. And, and he really did that. And the sad thing is, whenever a, a municipal person runs into ethical challenges, and it does happen, I mean, in any industry, you're going to have people that have ethical issues. Uh, it could be a mechanic that charges you for parts that he didn't change, a plumber that's tra charging extra hours. And unfortunately, in municipal life, there are people like that. And the sad thing is, is those people are always the front page of the newspaper. But a gentleman like my friend Guy Marie here that donated his own money and, and did everything to help the community. And even now, up until last year, he hasn't been a counselor for about 12 years now. Every Christmas, he donates money for our annual uh, Christmas uh, at our church. And he pays for a choir to come and sing Christmas carols. And he helps pay for the buffet so our families can have a nice Christmas dinner on Christmas Eve together. Um, guys like him don't get the media spotlight. And that's sad. And I think that's part of the problem is, you know, you have great people who do wonderful things in our communities as elected people, but they're ignored. But the one guy or girl with an ethical problem, boy, they're front page for a month. And, and I think that's something that, that that's hurtful and doesn't help the municipal world at all. Do you think that detracts people from getting into politics, especially at a municipal level? You talk about the ethicals, and don't get me wrong, we, we, we could go through the litany of federal and provincial ethical scandals across this pro country, and let's <laughs> be honest, there's a lot to name. But when municipal politicians get in the news, it's usually for something, and I, I say this with respect to all municipal councillors because there are a lot of good ones, it's usually for bad things. Oh, this person did this, or this person did that. Um, when we see people getting acclaimed. It tells me that people aren't getting involved and people don't want the microscope that is that comes along with provincial pol or municipal politics because they assume you go to provincial politics, it's party politics, it's partisan politics, so you're going to get attacked. You think, okay, I'm helping my community. I'm helping the betterment of my community. Good, bad, or the other, you're helping your community municipally. Why do you think more and more people are turning away from municipal politics in today's age? Do you think it is that microscope feeling that they might be put under? Or is there an other outlier that I'm not looking at right now that people are going, you know what? I don't want it because there's, like you said, with Guy, there's too much negativity. I think I think it's more of the negativity. I don't think people worry about being under the microscope i i think what people worry about is the personal attacks um name calling especially during election campaigns i've seen some election campaigns that were just brutally nasty and i'm like i, I would never you're talking about oh yeah really oh yeah oh yeah I, i've never seen i've seen some terrible ones over the years and, <laughs> and i always wonder why people act like that because it's not helpful to the to any debate for the community uh, the name calling, um, it, it, I think that's why people, they they look at the nasty to say, oh, I don't need this. I mean, Guy did it for me as a favor, um, and he wasn't really a political guy. He was an, a business expert, right? So he came in with that focus of, okay, what we can do, what can I do to help the finances of the municipality to make sure that we're healthy financially, that we keep taxes low? So he didn't see the the outskirts uh, of the nastiness that goes on uh you know, and in Quebec, people can be very nasty when it comes to elections. Uh, I kid you not. Um, well, that's what well, you, Quebec and Alberta have that very much in common. <laughs> <laughs> We're very much alike in a lot of ways, <laughs> Alberta. I, 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 like I say on the board of FCM, uh, the Albertans and the Quebecers get along great. We often find ourselves in a local watering hole after all the meetings, and uh, 
you know, joking around and teasing each other. And it's funny because I'm the, uh, the, the mayors of the rest of Canada call me Frenchy because I'm from Quebec, but the French mayors call me the English guy because I'm English. So I, I end up translating sometimes for the mayors of Quebec with the mayors of the rest of Canada. And I don't always uh, translate exactly what was actually said to make sure I can get a rise out of someone. <laughs> so we, we talk about the, st- the, uh, the quality of candidates as well a lot these days, because, uh, while municipal politics is the the local butcher, the local lawyer, the local school teacher, the so on, the mom and dad who stay at home, um, you need to be sort of up on what's going on in your community to sort of be a, an effective uh, municipal councillor. In your time in office, have you seen good politi- good municipal councillors come and go and bad municipals come and go? And you don't have to say names, and I'm kind of throwing this as an oddball question because you seem like a very honest and forward guy here, Scott, so that's why I'm, I'm willing to ask this question to you. But do you see good politi- good municipal councillors and bad uh, m- uh, municipal councillors in your time in office and not just for the township of Gore, but I'm saying because you sit on many boards and you are the warden of your uh, regional municipality as well. So have you seen good and bad politicians come and go? And can you tell what a good politician is, what qualities they have before they even do? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've uh, had the misfortune of working with a few mayors that I couldn't just couldn't tolerate. Um, I've, like I said, I've been lucky. I have great people here in my community. Every councillor I've ever, ever worked with, I have a uh, deep respect and a deep friendship with all of them. The ones that started with me, the ones who are with me today. I go out and find people. You know, I look at who's who's involved in the community, who's doing something positive. And then I ask them, would you like to be a councillor come next election? Because I see all the things you're doing locally and how you're helping out. But yeah, I've had some mayors where I just looked, I said, oh boy, I hope they only have one mandate because they're not helpful. And, and What's I've the, always said, if, I, if sorry, you start making, sorry, Fisco. I was going to say, what's the over under? Because you can probably, I'm assuming you've asked a lot of people in your time in office, especially since you've been there for 18 years, um, uh, to run for council. What are the over under to say yes and no from people? Like, are there more people saying yes if they are personally asked by someone than no? Because I can imagine there's not a lot of people thinking like at 11 o'clock at night, I should run for council. But if someone <laughs> asks you to run for council, there's probably a better chance you're going to put your name forward, right? I don't think I've ever had anyone refuse uh, me, if I if I remember. They've always said yes to me. Oh. Um, one of the things we're talking about, you know, good or bad, what I consider bad is, is a, an elected person. It could be a mayor, it could be a councillor, but whose only goal is to get reelected, who makes decisions based on their own reelection. I think to be a real leader, you have to make decisions that are best for the community. And then your job as a mayor is to sell that to the community, to explain it to people so they understand. Sometimes decisions are hard. Sometimes you have to go through some pain for the long-term benefit of a community. And if you don't have the cojones to do that, you shouldn't be a mayor. How do you do that, though? Because, okay, I'm going to be completely blunt here. You are one person. If I go into your community tomorrow, if I go to the township of Gore tomorrow and I ask all 2,500 people what their pressing issue is, they're all going to give me 2,500 different unique responses. Some might be the same. Some might say homelessness. Some might say economics. Some might say this. But uniquely, it's going to be their own. How do you as a council decide without trying to put that, I need to get reelected, so I need to do the majority of things that are going to be best for the majority of people? Because everyone's going to think their issue is the most pressing and the most unique. So as a councillor with or mayor <clears throat> with your tenure so far, have you found that balance of what's best for the community versus what's best for the individual person? Well, I'll tell you a story uh... We had, uh, I had a neighboring mayor. He was a great guy. I liked him a lot. We got along well, but there's a like a community or a neighborhood that's partly in his community and partly in mine. And they had an association, the Citizens of Lake Association. Anyway, the presence of this Lake Association hated my neighboring mayor and loved me. And one day we were having a beer after a meeting. He goes, tell me, why does he love you and he hates me so bad? I said, you know, when you say no, you just say no. When I say no, I explain to him that I'd like to be able to help, but I don't have any tools in the toolbox for this particular issue. But I'm going to think about it. I'll mull it over and I'll try and find a solution. So 
a lot of times it's not necessarily that you said yes or no. It's, it's, it's listening, showing that you care. And then after that, if you can't help on a certain file, but it's just, sorry, I don't have the tools, but if ever something arises that I can come back to you, I'll come back and I'll keep it in, in the back of my head. Whereas my buddy, unfortunately, he would just say no and not take the time to explain. So that fella didn't feel he was being listened to by the other mayor where with me, it was listened to. I think sometimes it's just as simple as that. You just have to show that you care, but we care, but we can't solve every problem. Some of them are municipal, are municipal jurisdictions. Some problems are federal. Um, okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt here for a second because you, you've opened up Pandora's box and I want to play in that for a few seconds here because sure. your constituents, no matter who they are, if they're a visitor or a tourist or a cottager or an actual resident of your community, they don't care. They will not care if it's a provincial issue or a federal issue. They want you as their elected official to fix it. So how do you balance that? Because I can imagine, and I know you said your wife is the member of the provincial government. So you, your house in Gore is probably the most powerful house in your riding of ever. So how do you balance the, I, I understand that this is a provincial issue, but they don't care. And I'm saying that with all due respect to your constituents, they want you because they're approaching you to fix it. So how do you balance that? Because that's probably the most challenging part of the ask the job is they don't care. They want you to fix it. Well, I, I think early on, that's what I realized is a lot of the problems we were having were federal or provincial jurisdiction. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm not going to blame those two governments. I'm going to get involved. So that's when I, was elected uh, on the board of the Federation of Quebec Municipalities. And that's when I ran to be on FCM so I can debate these things with the federal government. So rather than just blame provincial and federal, my people know here that I am fighting for them at those two other levels. So I, I think the fact that I'm proactive and saying, well, look, uh, the federal government's slow to move on this. I'm going to get more involved and I'm going to convince them to move on this. And I think they respect that. They appreciate that. And I, I'm very clear to them. And it's funny because before my wife was elected, there was another gentleman who uh, was uh, our member here. And and he asked me one day with the election coming up before my wife ran, you know, what do you think I should do? And I said, I think you need to meet with all the mayors. And he said to me, well, the mayors, is only one vote. I said, you don't get it, do you? <laughs> People in our community listen to us. If I say that and truthfully say the problems we're having is because the provincial government programs don't make sense to small towns it's all based for big cities my people listen and understand that so unfortunately for him he didn't listen he didn't bother speaking with the mayors and he got his, his butt handed to him an election uh against my wife <laughs> but uh yeah no i think i think that's where where i think our associations are very important whether it's the fqm for me and especially fcm on the federal level uh, we do make change. Um, I'll give you an example. For years, I've been uh, complaining that in Quebec, a lot of the programs they have for municipalities, they're so complicated and so expensive to, to, to deposit a project for your community that a lot of the small towns don't bother because they'd have to go externally to get an architect or an engineer because they don't have one on staff. So they have to pay money to build a project to deposit it for a grant. And if they don't get the grant, the money they spent is wasted. It's gone. So a lot of them don't bother. And, and it makes, you know, you're, you're creating stagnation in small communities. Well, I've been saying that to the provincial government for years. And last year, for the first time, our provincial government came up with a program for municipalities of 5,000 and less. And the money came directly to the municipality. No strings attached. We could use that money to fix anything we needed when it came to municipal infrastructure. And then, you know, send back the bills and show where the money went. So there's where, uh, you know, my work at, at that level has a good impact on my community. And I think that's what drives me is those changes. That's a small change, but for a small town to all of a sudden get the two to $300,000 a year extra to improve your local community center, your hockey rink, that's a big thing for a small town. And, and I think that's where my people, at least here in Gore, I mean, God bless me. I love them. They're, they're so kind to me. They're so, so nice to me. They see the efforts that I put in and, and and that it does bear fruit. Sometimes you're right. It's long. I mean, the federal government, oh, my God, they don't turn on a dime, eh? What? What are you <laughs> talking about? <laughs> oh, I'm still fighting a battle with the federal government that I started, I think, in 2008. 
So it's a different administration. It, it takes them a little a bit longer to get to things now. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. And but at least now the provincial government's on my side. So I'm thinking there may be some discussions between the feds and the government of Quebec on on, on this particular issue, which I think is a damaging issue for our environment. And uh, like I say, I've I've been fighting this fight for for close to 15 years now. So the next question I want to ask, and this is the last question in this segment, then I'm going to move on to the next one, is I want to go back to that very first time you walked into City Hall or Town Hall as an elected official. And I want to know from you, because this is a question I always ask people, because I want to know if it still holds true to them. How much weight and responsibility did you put on yourself to be the best you could be in that position as councillor and then mayor? Because the decisions you make at that table will affect your neighbors, your family members, your friends, your colleagues, your the business owners, the independent business owner. How much of a weight and responsibility did you put on yourself to be the best you can be, but also make the decisions that you believe, and sometimes people get things wrong, I understand that, are best for your community? And do you still hold that weight and responsibility today? Um, I think, obviously, uh, the first time I walked in after being elected, I felt just honored that that people wanted me to do this. And uh, I still feel that every day that I go to the town hall. I think the responsibility aspect, that started many years ago. Um, after I played football, I coached football. And coaching kids, uh, you realize that the decisions you make and how you comport yourself has an impact on those kids. So th- I feel the same way as mayor. You know, my... Uh, my attitude, uh, my behavior. I'm not a perfect man by far. I do cuss the odd time and I probably drink more rum than I should. Um, but I'm a human being. Uh, and I think that's part of the, I think that's why people here support me. They know I'm just a regular guy doing my best for them. Um, but yeah, I, you, you try to always to behave with class and you try not to lose your cool. It does happen the odd time. If someone's unreasonable, I can lose my cool like anyone else. Uh, when I do, I feel terrible about it. And uh, but, you know, there are people out there that like to push buttons and, they, you know, some people love an argument. So I, I try to avoid, uh, you know, how would I say being too tough on people or uh, but being you're sarcastic, human is, right? You're human. People make yeah. mistakes. And I, I, I can imagine going into a council meeting and you knowing what the agenda is or you knowing what the items you're going to be talking about is are you you do your research. You 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 ask the administration the uh, appropriate questions. Have you ever in your time in office been persuaded by a public hearing? a moment or a residence coming in and talking about an issue that they feel passionate about. You go, I never thought of it this way. I'm very glad you came in because now that I'm seeing both sides, I have administration telling me what's best for the the community, but sometimes what's best for the community isn't always best for the residents. So have you ever been persuaded by people who have given their passionate plea to say, no, let's not do it this way because this is how it's going to affect us. Absolutely. I, I tell people all the time, bring me your good ideas and I'll be happy to steal them. <laughs> I mean, my residents know that they call me, they email me, they, they offer ideas and projects. And if they're good and they're helpful to the community, I go along with them. And sometimes I'll even take a volunteer in the community and put them in charge of a file working directly with me. Uh, we've done quite a lot of that, actually. It's uh, it, to me, it's part of the job. It's part of the job is to listen to the people that you work for and and. and we're not all knowing. Um, and I've had a lot of people bring great ideas that we've used and uh, it makes them proud as community members as well that, hey, the, the council, the mayor, uh, I brought him an idea and he actually did it. And I think that's 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 community building at its base right there. I want to ask the sort of a simple question, but a sort of overarching question. And that is, and before I ask this question, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a question directed to the mayor and it's a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a decision by council. This is not a decision by the entire council. This is his opinion and only his opinion. Uh, So your worship, Mayor Scott, um, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the township of Gore today? And how are you? moving the file forward to rectify that issue or also change the issue to make it a solution for your community? I think the biggest issue we're facing right now is, is after COVID uh, 
our, our community rose in population by 20% during COVID. Um, a lot of new homes were built. A lot of new people came into the area. They want to get out of the big city and come more to a rural uh, lifestyle. What that did, unfortunately, we saw regular small homes normally would sell for 169 to 189,000. We're selling for 350 to 400,000. A four hundred thousand dollar house was selling for seven to eight hundred thousand. What that's done is that our municipal evaluations are all over the map this year. So some people their evaluation rose by seventy five percent, some by ten percent. So doing our budget, I could lower the mill rate, which which we did, like by nineteen cents, which is unheard of. But there's still going to be people paying a lot more in taxes this year, and some will be paying less because their house didn't jump in value as much, depending on the neighborhood. That's a big issue for me. And that's something that I've uh, obviously with FCM and FQM is, is, is the financing for municipalities. Um, as I said earlier, if you take every tax dollar in Canada, 45 cents goes to the feds, 45 goes to the provincial, the municipalities will give you all your basic day-to-day -day services, gets 10 cents. So your parks, your recreation, your administration, your land use planning, your environmental inspection, all that is done with 10 cents. <clears throat> so the burden falls on our residents and we're all the same taxpayer. What you pay provincially, you pay federal, you pay municipally, but municipal who gives you your day-to-day -day services. I think I have a bigger impact on my citizens than Mr. Trudeau does. Uh, nothing against him or even Mr. Legault in Quebec. Like they're, they're very well known and they're very popular, but at the end of the day, if you have a problem, you can't call them and say, Hey, there's a pothole in front of my road. I was or, gonna say, hey, like, the, if your garbage doesn't get picked up, you're not calling Francois Legault and saying, uh, "Premier, I need my garbage picked up." Who are they calling? It. The guy who gave them their cell phone number <laughs> to say my that's garbage it. didn't pick up. That's exactly it. So, like I say, I think that's where we have. That's where I I continue the battle, and and uh, the FCM does a great job with that, and uh, the FQM in Quebec here as well. It is municipalities need more help because you know we own sixty percent of the infrastructure of can in Canada. And we have to maintain that infrastructure on 10 cents on the dollar. It doesn't make sense anymore at this point. So uh, I think that that's an issue going forward. And I think every municipality agrees with that. So I'm going to ask the a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it in a way that it sounds makes me sound smart here. Um, the average person does not care what the hell a mill rate is. And I apologize. My it was French here. <laughs> Um, they don't care. They see an increase, even though you just said we we reduce taxes by 19 cents, which is great. The mill rate, though, is not taxes. And the mill rate decides what you're paying in taxes. So yeah. if your value of your property goes up 75 percent, you're paying more in taxes, even though the the municipality is saying it's lower. How hard is it for a municipality like you and a mayor like yourself to explain that? over and over again because you can go do mailers you can send out uh, brochures saying this is what's happening the average person i'm trying to be respectful here because i worked in communications for a municipality <laughs> don't read it so how hard is it for you to explain to people that because we are lowering your rate does not mean that your taxes aren't going to go up because the value of your property because people are moving in the value of properties are going up is determined by what you pay, not what we set at the tax rate. Well, I, you know, it's, 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 just, I think it's second time it's happened like this. It happened to us maybe about 12 years ago where we had, again, the, the evaluations jumped all over the place, depending on the neighborhoods. So I've explained it in the past and this year already, I've already explained it uh, publicly. Uh, we have a local once a month newsletter that we send to all of our citizens uh, by email uh, it's on our website so i do take the time to explain most people do understand it okay uh, there well you know like i say we have a community here that's very involved i i try to involve people that's that's the fun of what i do uh, i guess as a uh, as mayor here is i want people involved i want them to call me i want them to give me their ideas so they they understand most of them most i mean there's always people who don't read anything and uh, there are but when they question i just explain it to them that uh, we don't have control over the evaluation it's not done at the municipal level um and it, it's a it's a strange thing because when you're looking forward to selling your home you want the highest evaluation possible because you'll get more money when you don't want to sell your home you want the lowest possible so you pay less taxes so i think most people get that and and the mill rate, you know, like I said, I explain it uh, to everyone and, and uh, in writing as well. So they do understand the concept of uh, 
for every hundred dollars of evaluation, you're paying 60 cents uh, in taxes. And, you know, um, the fact that we lower the mill rate, I think people enjoy that because I know some municipalities that when the evaluations go up, they don't lower the mill rate. So that gives them a big surplus. And I'm, I am lean more conservative when it comes to taxation. I'm a business owner and I, you know, I always tend to, to uh, push a little harder on my pen when I'm writing a check to the government. Uh, like most people, I don't mind paying taxes. I, I, I think it's important. And I think most of us, what we care about, and I think in our community, it's the same as as long as the money is being well spent, I don't mind paying the taxes. Just make sure you spend the money well and has a positive impact on, on the community. And I think most of us, I think in our core, that's how we think. I want to turn to my last topic, and that is my favorite topic that I think a lot of people forget about, especially at municipal level, and that is tourism. Tourism, mm -hmm. tourism, tourism, because while it's a provincial issue, it's a federal issue, tourist dollars come into your community because people spend money in your businesses, people spend money in your hotels, so on and so forth. Um, if I was a visitor to your township, the township of Gore tomorrow, which it is on the list. If you come on this show, I am visiting your community either in 2023 or 2024. So get ready to see Chris Brown in the township of Gore and I will be meeting you in person. We might go grab a coffee, whatever. But what should people do? Because we have listeners from across Canada and around the world who have told me that they've come to Canada and they've gone to a community because they've been on the show. So what should people do in the township of Gore and what are some of the hidden gems in your community? Well, one of the, I say the, the main hidden gem we have uh, as a project we started, well, I've been working on it for a decade, but we finally got it done uh, last year. It's uh, we have a beautiful nature park, 600 acres, a lake, uh, um, you have bass, you have pike for fishermen, uh, you can paddle board. Now we're in the middle of building little cabins that you could rent uh, for a weekend or a week and, very rustic but uh basically it's a it's a it's a gem in the fact that, that you still see moose and bear and coyotes and we're only about 15 minutes from some of the best restaurants you could eat at in quebec uh my community is is small but my region of Algentre, uh the main city would be the city of la chute which is absolutely a beautiful little city um we have everything something for everybody um we're close to some of the best ski hills in, in north america we're an hour from Montreal, an hour and 15 from Ottawa. So we're kind of central to that. We have some of the best muskie fishing on the Ottawa River for fishermen. Um, some amazing spas for people that want to pamper themselves. Um, a great nightlife. Uh, there's everything. You know, it's, it's, it's not like a big city, right? You have to kind of wander out from my community, maybe go 20 minutes for a, one of the nicer golf courses. We have a beautiful golf course uh, neighboring to us, which is a, it's only a nine hole golf course, but then you have to be a mountain goat because it's built on a mountain. Um, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a historic it, country. Club. Okay. This is, this is a bet right now. If I come to Gore, you and I have to go play nine holes in a, in a, on a mountain because that oh. just sounds fantastic. Oh no, it's, it, you gotta be a mountain goat. I, I, <laughs> Every time I go, I, I, I'm i exhausted. After the nine holes, I'm right in the bar saying, okay, give me a double rum and coke and something to eat. I'm, I'm just burnt out here. That's a beautiful course. And uh, it celebrated its 100th anniversary uh, this just last year. And they renovated it all. Big, beautiful log building. <laughs> uh, all the history of that golf course. And we have a lot of... Uh, the Le Chute Golf Course, the, the uh, Canadian Tour, who actually played their championships there for many years, which is about 15 minutes from my house as well. Uh, some of the best microbreweries you'll find are in City of La Chute. Uh, it's a beautiful little city. Uh, I love it there. And uh, yeah, there's there's just like I say, there's something for everyone around the the, the Laurentians in general. You know, um, we're kind of a central part of the Laurentians in Quebec. And so in the Laurentians, you have Mont Tremblant, you have Saint Sauveur, you have you know the the ski hills, uh, Morin Heights. My one of the neighboring municipalities is known as the cross country ski capital. So, uh, and even on my, my, our little nature park, we've so far got 25 kilometers of trails for uh, snowshoeing, hiking, mountain biking, uh, fat biking. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of. You're selling me on it, Mayor. You're selling me on it. I, I kind of want to come just this year. I'm going to come like in funny, the summer. <laughs> it's funny because like our community is based on nature. You know, uh, we have 26 lakes and streams and it's just beautiful. But within 15 minutes, you can eat at some of the best restaurants you'll find in Quebec. So we have the best of both worlds, right? You can go 
see a show at a nice club, uh, have a great meal, but then 15 minutes later, you're back home. And as you pull up, there's a deer in your driveway. So you get the best of both, you know, and, and I think that's the main thing uh, that my, my residents here really, really love that. And they, they really support, uh, you know, unfortunately some people find we're extreme when it comes to environment. I wouldn't say uh, we're extreme. I think we're protecting why people come here, you know, because we don't, you know, we're a small town. We don't have uh, the West Edmonton mall. Um, so people come for nature. They don't come to shop. Uh, they want to shop. They go to one of the bigger communities around us. So, so that's the main thing here uh, in our community is nature. If you want access to nature and uh, you're an outdoorsman and you want to fish uh, or hunt or, you know, you have the best of everything here. So for you, though, after a hard day at council, after just a stressful day at council at business, whether it be the regional municipality or your local township council or just a, a hard day at work, where do you go? Where do you go to decompress? I know you're going to say sometimes some people say they're home, but is there a special spot in your township that you can go and you can just get away and all your negativity can just flow away? Um, For me, it's it's my wife um Aww. when she's here no but when she's here she's obviously in quebec city a lot because our capital is quebec city so if she's sitting at the national assembly she has to be in quebec but uh we have this way that uh when we're together after a long day i make a nice rum and coke with a little lime because a little lime makes it feel like you're on vacation she has a glass of wine and we just discuss our day you know uh what she did, uh, how her meetings went, the things she's really hopeful about, about improving life for the people here. And, uh, and I go through mine. And then, and to me, that's like, uh, that's the best part of my day every day. We do, um, we live on a lake. So my wife and I both, uh, enjoy fishing. Um, I, I taught her a lot and now she's catching bigger fish than me. So that's getting under my, my skin a little bit. So I'm going to have to solve that issue, but we spend, um, you know, in the past, we could spend as much as 18 hours a day on the boat fishing. Um, just just being out in nature. Uh, I don't eat fish very much, uh, maybe once a year. So we tend to catch them, kiss them, and put them back in the water. But uh, I do, um, we used to go to Lake Ontario a lot uh, when I could get some time. And uh, I have a smoker, so I'd smoke some salmon and give it away to my neighbors and my friends and stuff like that. And uh, the other thing I like to do is cook. I cook a lot. I, I I, like I said, I have a smoker. I have one of those giant deep fryers for deep fried turkeys and things like that. And uh, the kids get a kick out of that because I'll find the, any recipe with bacon, uh, I'm in. <laughs> you and me both, sir. You and me yeah, both. And the kids and, and our daughters are a little more health conscious than I am. They, they just say, Dad, we're not truckers. I say, well, you swear like truckers? I might as well feed you like truckers. <laughs> um, Us kids, so we, we have. My last question before we have to wrap up here, uh, Scott, is this. What makes the Township of Gore, and I'm going to say the Township of Gore plus the region, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, people here are just nice. They get along. Um, you know, you obviously in the rest of Canada, there's you hear issues about French and English and language fights and stuff like that. That's not a, an issue here. Uh, here, English and French get along well. Uh, people are very kind to each other, generally speaking. You're going to have some issues at times, but generally speaking, people are really nice. And uh, I'm amazed at my community here in Gore. Uh, during COVID, uh, we had volunteers that volunteered their time, and uh, they would spend their days phoning the elderly people, making sure they were okay, uh, going down to La Chute, uh, our main city, to pick up their medications, their groceries, so the elderly didn't have to leave the house that were worried about catching COVID. So really a community spirit, that was kind of my goal all along was to build a community spirit. I, I think every community needs that. And uh, in Alcantara, my region, the nine municipalities, English and French get along well and people just get along well. And when there's a problem or um, years ago, it happened, we, our French and our English high schools are connected. And the French side had a, had a fire, a major fire. And uh, the French families were worried that their kids were going to lose their school year. Well, the English school opened up for the French kids to come over and they got to finish their school year with the English kids. And that created, uh, you know, a, a bond uh, between English and French that there's, there's really that, that, you know, and, and I speak French fluently, 
but a lot of times French people want to speak to me in English. And I'm saying, I, I, I speak French. Said, yeah, but we want to practice our English. I said, okay. So I, I speak French to them. They speak English to me. And uh, I had um, some friends come up not long ago. And that's what they said. They said, wow, people here are just really nice. And I said, let's, I don't know if it's because we have the environment we do. You know, we have, you know, lakes galore and mountains and, uh, one of the best white water rafting uh, places on the entire planet is, is up in one of our municipalities, Grenville Sur La Rouge. It's, uh, it's known worldwide as one of the, the, the best uh, white water rafting places you can go to. So, you know, people that come leave here, it's not a well known area compared to the rest. If you think of Mont Tremblant and all the bigger places in Quebec, but it's that small, tight knit community that makes it very welcoming for people and uh, a great place to live. And I, I I often, and this is where that this question this segment comes from, is we often forget to tell the hidden gem stories. Like, okay, we talk about the staples, we talk about like Jasper, Banff, and Alberta, we talk about Mount Tremblant in Quebec, but what about the white water rafting? What about the this, that, and the other? So that's where this is all coming from is there are great tourist destinations across this country and municipalities that we're not telling. So I'm gonna try and tell them this year. Um, well, that's something my wife and I have been working on, and uh, our premier got involved, is access to nature. You know, we got to give people access to nature. We saw during COVID in Quebec here, during COVID, you couldn't buy a kayak. You couldn't buy a canoe. They were sold out because people, the bars were closed, the restaurants were closed. The only good thing about COVID is it drove people back to nature. And, and you know, now, I mean, my, our little park, our trails are full of people all the time, uh, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing. I think that was uh, something that our government understood and my wife being there and, and talking with the, the premier and myself on the municipal scale. Um, I, I think we're seeing more and more uh, of these hidden gems, not just being promoted, but new ones being created because mm -hmm. I think we saw the impact of COVID, how people want to be out in nature, want to kayak or canoe or fish. or and I think that's the 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 only good thing COVID gave us really was, was people learning to love nature again and get out and get off the Xbox and get on a canoe. Well, Scott, I want to thank you so much. I know I said 45 minutes and we are almost at the hour mark. So I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been uh, such an enlightening conversation at this such early morning hour. So thank you so much for doing this. And I appreciate your time, uh, giving your time to just a random person who sent you a message on Twitter one day. So thank you so much. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, for your interest. I'm very, very proud of the municipal people that I get to work with every day. And I think they need to be put more in the spotlight because, you know, as we said, there may be one to 5% uh, that maybe shouldn't be there. The other 95% work hard every day in their communities and they deserve to be, be applauded and congratulated. I'm so proud just to be one of them. Uh, I, I know some mayors and, and I absolutely love them. Uh, they work hard, they're decent, kind, honorable people. And uh, I think we need to put a spotlight on that. So thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, thank you. So with that, as I say, always to exit the interviews, get off social media, put down your phone, Go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy. It helps our society. And it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. We will be back tomorrow with another great episode. Talk to you then.